All right, we are officially live. I just want to welcome everyone to the Global Landscapes Forum Digital Summit on Inclusive Finance. Um, and I will hand it over now at this point to our moderator to introduce our speakers and the conversation for today. Hi, Selena. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Digital Summit on Inclusive Finance and Landscapes. Uh, my name is Gerhard Mulder, and I will be your moderator for today. Now, the Digital Summit is organized by CGGIR a research program on forest trees and agroforestry, which is also known by its acronym FTA. And it's part of a bigger learning journey on inclusive finance, which was initiated within the framework of the FTA, Topobos International and C4. Now that work stream includes a series of interviews with key stakeholders of the value finance value chain. And you can find these interviews on the FTA website as well as on the Topobos International website. And furthermore, Topobos and C4 are writing an article on how to scale innovative finance for landscapes. And after that finance article is published after the summer, then we will have an e-dialogue with participants, including hopefully you. And finally, we plan to present our findings and conclusions on the Global Landscape Forum, the investment case later this year in Luxembourg. So after all the thinking and the brainstorming and writing, we have entered the more interactive phase, which is by any means a lot more fun, because that phase uh, means that we are interacting with you. Um, we have a great panel of experts here today, and for the next hour or so, we will ask them about their experience on how to promote inclusive finance. Um, you will see two of the three people at the moment, um, number Three is uh, currently trying to get online onto the platform, but I would like uh, for now to introduce Marco Boscolo, who is a forestry officer with the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and Juan Carlos Gonzalez Aybar, who is the director and head of Latin America at Ophelia Funds. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be waiting for Pauline Nantongo, who is the executive director of EcoTrust of Uganda. So um, also what we see now is that we have about uh, 90 people present, which is, I think, fantastic. So thank you all very much for tuning in uh, here today. And uh, perhaps uh, what I can start asking uh, is both of the people who are present here, Marco, perhaps you go first. Um, what is your organization doing on inclusive finance. Can you please share with us? Uh, yes, thank you, Gerhard, for moderating this and also for this initiative. It's an excellent initiative. Um, well, I feel it's a very large organization. I can speak what uh, we're doing. I, I sit now in the forestry department and uh, on uh, inclusive finance for forestry trees and agroforestry. There are various teams working. I can mention at least three of them. One is the forest and farm facility. Uh, there is uh, one on works on forest and landscape restoration. And where I'm working is the forest governance and economics team. And our work is very much, uh, what it has in common is this uh, mandate to reduce uh, rural poverty, which is one of FAO strategic objectives, and also to enable more inclusive forestry value chains. Uh, as a background, I can say that uh, finance um, one of the things we, we do together is, is not seen as a, as a root problem, but more as a symptom of a problem, uh, symptomatic of uh, value chains that are too fragmented in forestry, the perception of forestry as uh, very high risk, uh, unattractive investment conditions, for example, weak governance, inadequate infrastructure, high transaction costs, lack of financial literacy, uh, poor communication between the forest and financial sector, and something that is uh, quite uh, important for inclusive finance is the limited capacity of some of the stakeholders to attract and to access uh, finance. Uh, two things that uh, I can mention we're currently doing, uh, one is that we are uh, finalizing a value chain assessment framework that can be very helpful uh, to obviate some of these issues. And the second one is that uh, uh, we have been working in the last uh, year, especially to try to 
promote uh, private finance in, in forestry and landscapes. We organized a meeting here in Rome in early April where we gathered a number of companies and funds that are investing private uh, resources in, uh, in landscape and forestry, especially in Africa, an area where it is very difficult to attract uh, private finance. And out of this meeting, we have uh, gained, uh, you know, quite a few lessons in terms of uh, what would be important to to catalyze further and scale up uh, this uh, finance and, and inclusive finance. I have a number of uh, recommendations that came out of this meeting. I don't want to share them all. If any of the participants are interested, we have a report of this meeting. But I want to mention, uh, first of all, the development of capacity building for this uh, uh, let's say, more uh, marginalized stakeholders uh, on how to access uh, forest investments, uh, the importance of uh, having good guidelines uh, for contracts on how these players can engage in bigger value chains, uh, to document the uh, case studies of business models, because actually there are quite a few experiences out there that are working and they need to be, uh, they deserve to be documented better and disseminated better and also for the promotion of dialogues uh, among actors uh, in the value chain. So. That sounds really good, thank you so much. So it seems like none of the problems that we've uh, come across so far uh, are not able to be solved. We can solve all these problems. Juan Carlos, uh, can you please let me know what you do on inclusive finance in Latin America? Yes, so b very briefly, uh, uh, I, will, I will explain a little bit what, what is Antilia, uh, what, I, what we do on a daily basis, and hopefully through this, uh, yeah, answer your, your question, how we contribute to inclusion, in, inclusive finance. Um, so Altelia, it's, or Altelia Funds is an impact asset manager, but fully dedicated to land use and climate change mitigation. So we, we have this double uh, mandate of investing in sustainable land use. Um, and then uh, through this also mitigate climate change. We, we, we as an impact asset manager, we, we manage funds. So we have a, a series of, of different funds. We started with the Antilla Climate Fund, uh, which is a hundred million euro investment fund that is now fully invested. Uh, and we, we mainly did, um, investments in Latin America, I would say 60% and then 40% between Asia and Africa, working with the protected areas, cooperative of producers, financing, uh, running costs of conservation, uh, green capex, mainly productive uh, systems in agroforestry and getting our returns through uh, cacao, coffee and carbon. So we, we actually mixed uh, into a period of time of an investment, which will be uh, roughly 10 years. We, 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 we deploy capital tickets between five to 10 million for financing infrastructures, route to market uh, and green capex. Also, we, we could finance as well uh, working capital. And then we will recover our investments through the activities that we finance with a complement on, on, on the environmental services that we, that we, that we monetize. Um, we started seven years ago, uh, roughly like a, like a startup, uh, the two founders and myself, then the, the team grew, um, one of 60 million euro. And then we grew to the 100 million euro that, that fund. Now we have launched a sustainable oceans fund, land reduction neutrality fund. And two years ago, we, we, we have been, we entered into this merge with the subsidiary of a French bank called Natixis. Uh, the subsidiary is Mirova, which is the, the fully responsible investment branch of Natixis. Mirova is $10 billion, $10 billion of assets under management. Natixis is $1 trillion, and we are, we are roughly $500. Uh, but we are being part of a larger story. We start very small, and but we see that large institutional investors, both private and public, are interested by inclusive finance and land use because their shareholders are asking for it. So actually, what we are what we are trying to do is to 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 propose uh, to institutional investors, being insurance companies, development banks, 
uh, uh, and other type of of, of uh, institutional investors uh, investment solutions for lands for land use because we know and all the studies say that there are you know billions of dollars of investments that are needed that there are plenty of investment opportunities but opportunity is a little bit more than an idea no because we know roughly okay we should invest in Latin America in the Amazon maybe in the highlands in Peru but that's that's not really a project so what we do uh, so we, we pitch to investors um, to, to that there are the opportunities we, we develop the opportunities we pack them to the investment products we raise the funds and we deploy it so what we are doing for inclusive finance is actually paving uh, the, 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 the road or the path for institutional money big bucks uh, real dollars to, to go to cooperatives to NGOs to people that is really engaged in the field in this conservation activity so my my interest my interest uh, of participating in this DG summit and thank you for the invite is to to actually uh, bring a little bit of, of optimism that things are moving in the market uh, that uh, a lot of people uh, are, are doing a lot of good things and uh, I will just encourage you to, to, to keep the fight to, to continue because uh, the, the money is that I was saying uh, uh, our colleague Marco mm -hmm. uh, the barriers of course is still there but when you have uh, when you have when you put money at risk you you you, you solve pro pro problems quite quickly because you feel responsible for the money you are administrating right. uh, so we so, sense Altilia uh, is bringing that solution fantastic um, now Thor Propose International uh, has done a series of um, really insightful interviews with a variety of stakeholders we've asked you to take a close look at these uh, interview series and I was just wondering um, you know, do some of these barriers and the solutions that you come across, um, do you recognize that from the um, uh, from from the interview series? Uh, can you can you comment on that, Marco? You go first. Marco, your um, your mic is probably off. Okay, sorry. Okay, there thank you. you. Um, uh, well. Uh, I, I read some of these interviews, and I, I my my first uh, two reactions is that uh, first of all, that it was uh, really a, a great initiative. Uh, there's a lot of value in in sharing and exchanging, uh, like uh, it was done experiences, lessons, perspectives, and uh, I I really encourage this uh, exchange uh, to be continued. And um, I think one of the, the, the challenges I think that uh, that uh, has been highlighted uh, that uh, maybe I can I can mention specifically is that uh, this uh, population that are more marginalized for a number of reasons uh, it might be geographic it might be of their background or maybe they are, belong to uh, minorities or indigenous people or women etc. I mean one of the Key issues is is the importance to attend to and and increase their their productive capital. You know, make sure that, that what they can get from their labor is 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 multiplied, is increased. You know, kind of get them out of this uh, of this poverty trap. And I think uh, all the interviews in one form or another have shared uh, some elements that are critical and I, I just want to highlight three of them. I think the key, one of the key things is definitely uh, the importance of rights, of uh, tenure rights, of rights over land, over the resources uh, and uh, how important it is to advocate for these rights and, and, and to protect those rights. Uh, the second one is uh, that uh, uh, Marco. Marco, you know, if I may, if I may, yeah. uh, just to follow up on on that uh, the tenure rights, I thought yes. One one thing in the interview series I thought was very interesting, uh, which was an interview with the founder of Comaso, um, and uh, Comaza. I'm sorry, uh, and that they uh, rather than having formal rights. Uh, basically, what they said was, you know, it is enough if your neighbors 
if, uh, if, if, if your local chief uh, does not object to you claiming this land, which is you know, a step down perhaps from having formal tenure rights, uh, would you agree that that is, you know, for s in some occasions, perhaps an interesting way out of uh, the problem of having formal entitlements? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think in some cases, uh, it is sufficient to have, uh, let's say, agreement, uh, especially, for example, when you have uh, communal rights and uh, those as a community, they are fairly secure. But uh, in many cases, uh, for example, the, the, land, the land belongs to the government. Mm. Uh, the government makes agreements, maybe with some private company, uh, and then this private company is obliged to make agreement uh, yet with uh, with the local communities. And these secondary uh, rights, uh, you know, do not have any standing uh, from a legal viewpoint. And uh, so uh, we have a number of, uh, I think it depends on the context. I would say that in some cases, uh, I know uh, some of these cases, for example, in Central America, where indeed it is not necessary that you have such a formalized uh, ownership rights, that it is sufficient. But, uh, but that we cannot uh, really generalize the situation to, to many other contexts. Uh, in Africa, for example, it is more complicated. Right. right. I interrupted you, uh, Marco. I do apologize. Uh, you were one of three. So what are the other two? Okay, the other two, I think is, uh, it has been mentioned by, by a few, and I, I also want to highlight the importance of, of uh, strengthening the organizations of these uh, small producers. So uh, everything that, uh, uh, that can facilitate that, I think it's a, it's a very uh, excellent uh, support, and to develop human capacities. I mean, many, many of the previous uh, speakers I spoke of lack of uh, literacy or of financial literacy or, or business literacy or how to manage natural resources. I think this is, uh, these are investments that do not, uh, they're not investments in assets, but are investments in people and in their society, in their organization that I, they have proved to, to be, uh, you know, investments that deliver in the long run. Fantastic. So, Juan Carlos, uh, you're on the ground in Peru working on projects. Um, you must have come across the same issues here. How have you addressed, um, you know, some of these barriers? For example, um, you know, there's there's the the tenure rights issue. Uh, there is um, how how do you how do you make chocolate out of all of all of these ingredients? First, uh, we. Uh, we we rely in, in in local institutions. So because we we are investors, we are not project developers. Uh, nevertheless, we co-build investment the investments we we do, and 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 so we 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 rely a lot in in a small local institutions that have proved uh, to to do right and have good experiences at small level, and then that with capital we can scale up. And make it bigger of course they have come through this kind of issues and we as investors we also need to to, to to innovate a little bit in the way we for example we execute warranties you know for our investments in the mm -hmm. case of for example cacao uh, large investment we, we did in the buffer zone of the tambopata national reserve restoring degraded lands uh, that were abandoned for that were previously deforested for papaya or cattle so we restore these lands and to put cacao there. And so many of the families, 70% of the families, more than that, it actually 90% of the family didn't have a, a property title at the beginning. So we say how we will invest in these lands that then two years after they will be invaded or they will leave. So we, we, we talk, at, we, 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 we work a lot with, with them. And then we realize that they could be titled but it was, it's just that they are not, they don't have this habit of bureaucracy, you know, right. measuring, going to the Ministry of Agriculture. So then you realize that with the small steps, you can get, you can get, you know, this, 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 um, this formalization. But then also as an investor, 
you you say you you realize that it won't be wise to take a guarantee on investment on the land they are living there for 30 years so for example for investing in the partnership we do instead of getting a guarantee on that land you know as a traditional you know uh financial or microfinance institution we actually introduce a promissory note that is actually a promise of payment of yeah. for these people which is non collateralized by land but if you default in your payment which you know is very very small is 205 dollars over six years <laughs> and we are talking about peru so but if you default on that you pro you protest a promissory note into a notary then you send it to the credit bureau and they cannot get even a, a phone you know or, or a credit card or this kind of thing right. so you have other types of implementing this type of, of guarantees the card and stick so you, you you innovate when you go to the field you will have certainly some some barriers but there there are the possibilities to 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 actually solve it right 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 and in the meantime i'm very happy to see uh, pauline natongo uh, having entered our digital summit. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry that it was so hard to come online. Hi, Pauline, how are you? Hi, I'm also glad that I've finally made it. Hi. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. And um, so just, uh, we already had uh, started uh, the conversation, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Can you just, um, in just a few minutes, perhaps, share with us what your organization does in Uganda? and um, share with, yours, with us your, uh, your insights on what inclusive value, uh, finance means to you and what your organization does about it. Okay, I work in Uganda with an organization called uh, Ecotrust. It's a local NGO and we specialize in what is uh, known as conservation financing. So we work with mainly rural poor smallholder farmers uh, these are very resource poor people that depend on natural resources for their food, water, fuel, wood, building materials, all their basic needs are dependent um, on the natural resources. But they are also far removed from, uh, from markets, from sources of financing. So what my organization does is we identify the resources that they live with, we identify the innovations that, that they have and, and package them into bankable um, opportunities uh, to be able to, to access multiple financing sources throughout the, the entire rotation period of, of sustainable land use. So it's a blended financing model right. where, right. Yeah, where public funds are combined with private funds as well as uh, internally generated revenue from from the land use option itself. Fantastic! So you really are on the front line, uh, doing doing great work. Um, now, um, as I asked um, the other two panelists, um, you know, you also read the interview series that was conducted by Global Boss International. And uh, were there some elements of those interview series that um, uh, some some barriers and solutions to scaling inclusive finance? What were yes. some of the takeaways uh, that that you um, that you noticed, uh, and do you recognize this? Yes, uh, that uh, one of the things I recognize is that the challenges are similar. The mm -hmm. challenges are similar, except they present themselves in different uh, in different forms. Right. Because because they, they, they present themselves according to the to the is to the context in which you're operating, but they are all the same. Um, accessibility to to the to where the financing is 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 a problem. The challenge of aggregation, uh, being able the, the, being able to achieve scale, yet even when you achieve scale, there's a lot of fragmentation. With, with the people that you're dealing with. Um, the perception of risk, uh, where the, 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 where the financing comes from, the way they look at the people that we work with as if they are a risky lot. And, and I saw that it takes a lot of innovation to be able to, to, to access uh, these, um, these, these opportunities. 
Well, I find it interesting that you, uh, just like Marco a few minutes ago, you did not have the benefit of, of hearing that, I believe. Um, but you don't talk about risk, but you talk about perceived risk. And I think there's yes. a real crucial difference there. Um, yes. Because perceived risk is really in the eye of the beholder, right? Yes. Uh, and, uh, it, and it doesn't have to be real risk. Now, um, Perhaps uh, Juan Carlos, um, you know, you're a finance expert. Um, would you agree that banks or financial institutions, investors, don't invest in assets or projects that they don't know, that they don't understand? And the reason why you're so successful is because you have real intimate knowledge on landscape, landscape use, uh, agroforestry, and are able to build businesses around that. I'm afraid that um, your microphone might still be off. Is that, is that possible? Yes. Mm. Sorry. Yes. Now, now, it's good? It's good. Perfect. No, I, it's, <laughs> thank you. It's a little bit tricky because there are you know, trillions of dollars have been lost during the financial crisis for investors that invest in things that they didn't understood. And so a lot of investors invest in things they don't understand, and that's okay. And a lot of things in, in bad things, uh, but it's just the track record and, and the previous, you know, uh, financial returns that they have got, and then you have bubbles. In land use, we, have, we, we are seeing a lot of investors that they are okay if they understand, they are okay that if they don't, they are not educated, but at least they need to find people that understand that and can work with them. And so I think that's that's a crucial difference because of course, institutional investors won't become uh, land use experts and they don't need to in the part of the value chain of, of climate finance and land use. You mm -hmm. have people like, like you guys, then people, you know, like, like FAO or our friends as well. Um, in a, a in a, a sorry uh our colleague that has just joined is yeah, from uh, yeah from uganda yes pauline yes from uganda so i think what what is what there are few investors that are ready to be the 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 the, the, the first ones to to raise the money and now that that we will have track record others will come so I, yeah. I think that uh, if they, they are uh, more and more knowledge about the, the, the risk. Some uncertainties have gone because, you know, the Paris Agreement has been signed by more than 190 countries. It's a reality and will stay. So big companies, being oil and gas companies, being food uh, and consumer goods companies, the, the uh, investors, large institutional investors, they understand this. So this will happen uh risk will be uh you know better under better understood i think what it will really be a game changer is that these different institutions across the value chain of, of climate finance uh, uh gather more uh are more active because uh the funds i think uh they, they are coming they are coming and uh one you know it's very young this this climate finance and land use investments i think in two three four years we'll have more some success stories will, will be here. So there will be some track record on agroforestry returns, uh, conservation, carbon markets on related to red. And so I, I think uh, things, things, things will, will get better. Fantastic. Now, to what extent um, is it important that we connect different networks of different types of actors? Uh, Marco, um, I, I know that you're you, you do a lot of work and you already mentioned some of the work that FAO is doing. Um, how do you bring governments uh, to the table? What is the role of governments, for example, in other stakeholders, the private sector, the banking sector? Um, how do you connect these networks and who should be uh, convening these networks? And should that be happening uh, on the local level or on the international level or both? Well, you, you ask many questions here uh, at the same time. Uh, I would say that uh, it is essential to connect these networks. Uh, you mentioned uh, local bankers. Of course, these uh, 
uh, let's say, resources from the north are key. Uh, very interesting, the developments that we are witnessing. Uh, there's also a lot of resources in the countries that are growing and that uh, maybe yes. we have discussed a little bit less. And, uh, and there again, we have uh, an issue really of understanding because uh, what a banker in a developing country will know about forestry is uh, maybe uh, they will see what they read in the newspaper, which is usually about uh, invasions or wildfires or social conflict and so it has kind of a exaggerated negative perception of what it means to invest in this uh, in, in, in forestry and landscape it is not really seen as a as a as a business with potential uh, so that is one thing and the government obviously they can do a lot uh, i think almost every interview I have read has mentioned the importance of an enabling environment for investment. And I think uh, the government plays a, a key substantial role in, in this. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, to, to make sure that the rules are clear and they are respected, not only when it comes to rights, uh, but also other uh, obligations that the country has made in terms of legality. Uh, Etc. cetera, um, governments can also, you know, really promote a lot of public finance instruments. I mean, I, uh, I know some countries now that they are accessing climate finance, they have some kind of a benefit sharing agreements or revenue sharing agreements, whereby some of the resources that the country gets, get distributed or redistributed at the local level to promote the sustainable uh, forestry and sustainable la landscape activities. Uh, you know, governments can have public procurement policies whereby uh, the products that are produced by marginalized poor people in remote locations somehow get uh, preferential uh, access. Uh, here in FAO, for example, we're exploring linking forest and landscape with the, with the school feeding programs, you know, with homegrown school feeding programs where uh, you know, agricultural products that are produced by small farmers get purchased by the government to feed their children when they go to school. Or there might be right. specific uh, investment programs, like uh, in Guatemala there is one that I know a little bit uh, uh, quite well, that supports specifically small producers. Uh, so these are just a few things. I mean, I, the list goes on. If I have time, I can share some more. Great. Now, Pauline, does that resonate with you? Um, and uh, how do you? What is your experience with the uh, the local government in in Uganda, or maybe not the local government, but the government in general in Uganda? Um, are they are they helping you? Are they um, investing in creating that enabling environment? Hi, Pauline, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, there you are. Yes, okay. So, yeah, uh, so the, the, uh, there, are, there are lots of um, enabling laws or enabling environment. Right. And uh, we work with the local government to mainly they support the mobilization of, of, uh, of communities. Mm -hmm. When it comes to access to financing, they are just as poor as the as the communities that um, they, they work with. What when we were working with them, we are supporting the implementation of their own policies by bringing in foreign direct investment. So we focus we focus mainly on bringing in the investment that they wouldn't have been able to access. So that that is what we specialize in as an organization because. Even the little that they have, um, they, they never receive it. Uh, normally, the budgets are met, but when push comes to shove, the environment and natural resource management are not really among the priority list. The priority list, the priorities are things like health and emergency situations. So things like forests, they are looked at as resources to bring in income but not necessarily resources that need to be invested in. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so normally, 
yeah, normally we access public financing, but from multi bilateral and multilateral donors. Right. Okay. Now, yes. Building on that, um, so so I my my guess is that there's at least some um, some ODA, some donor money uh, involved uh, there. Yes. Um, and in general, um, how would you? describe your experience with that are there lots of strings attached or um, do you feel that some of this money is also in a way risk capital and that if you make mistakes which is you know inevitable when you are innovating um, that that you're not being punished uh, for for that do you know what My, I'm yes I um, do my my our experience and the way we are currently approaching it is that there is a type of financing that is appropriate for every stage of the growth so we work with the smallholder farmers and what we do is to transform the smallholder farmers such that the sustainable land use approaches become a profitable venture so we work with the smallholders, we make each one of them write a land use plan, which also doubles as a business plan. So we access donor funding for, for the preparatory activities, for the project design activities, for the project development activities, for the project expansion activities. And then, then after we have established the program, then we access private financing, but through sale of environmental services. So most of our approaches are market-based incentives. So, so the farmer, or, uh, the, the landowner looks at these as various income streams. So at the beginning, when we have nothing, then we can use donor funding. And the conditionalities of the donor funding are achievable at that stage. They are to develop management plans, their awareness activities, capacity building, but we use being able to access private financing as one of the indicators of success. Great. So when we have established that, then we quantify the environmental services that come from that land use uh, activity, and then we sell them on, on, on the voluntary carbon market and, and other environmental service markets. Other environmental service markets have been very difficult to find buyers for because they are perceived to be local in nature. And like I said, we are all, uh, scarce uh, resource scarce so it has been a lot easier to access the carbon markets because that's a global market we right. have had instances of, of selling watershed services but that has been very very minimal now i see a real nice connection here because juan carlos um you know you basically start where pauline ends right you know you you when you uh, are looking for projects you're looking yes. exactly for the kind of yes. work the preparatory work that already has been yes. done by Pauline and and her colleagues. Yes, and that, and that's that's really wonderful because is is it it really shows that that Pauline they they are really doing hands on and understand how the, how how these things work, and the way that we use we know that to change the dynamic on from an unsustainable land use practices to a sustainable land use before the non-carbon revenues take off it will it will take a while you know uh three four five years you know that you build you, you build the trees you put a revenue model you have the optic agreements and that if you you are in the value chain like a cow or coffee it is global if you're in local products it's even more difficult so we really have seen that the carbon is a powerful tool for making this transition to sustainable land use. This is why we, when we arrived, as you well said it, Gerard, we arrived from day one and, and you know, from estimations on the environmental services, we provide that financing for this, you know, that valley period, five, six years, seven years that, you know, that that the, the non-carbon activities need to take off. So by doing an offtake agreement year by year, uh, of the environmental services paying by results. So under we, we have a five, six, seven, ten year agreement, depending on, on, on the project, uh, where, where we finance and we deploy the capital in a quarterly basis based on as as Pauline was saying was saying on uh, on indicators of, of, of activities. Right. And then one of these activities are 
of course, the productive activities, but the other are also the preparation or the activities. And, and we believe it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that works in, our, in two of our projects out of the six projects in Latin America. We already have passed that period of, of the subsidy from environmental services and now the cooperative and the people's living from cacao, for example, or from coffee. But without the carbon on these five, six years, wouldn't have been, it, it would have been impossible. To, to arrive there. So Pauline, congratulations on, on the work you are doing because it's fundamental. Very nice. Yes. And Marco, what, what is what is your opinion about uh, about this? And how do you do you see any role for institutions such as FAO to you know multiply the Ophelias and the eco trusts of, of, of this world? Um, because there's only one Althelia, unfortunately. We need a hundred of uh, Althelias. I mean, there's only one eco trust, but we need a thousand eco trusts. Tens of thousands. Well, I obviously <laughs> I don't <laughs> have an unbiased opinion, but uh, when we we uh, let me say that uh, FAO has uh, does not have a history of working directly with the private sector, but obviously. Our, our role is really to help countries, the member countries are, are, are basically our key constituency, to make those necessary changes that will attract, you know, the, 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 the organizations like Altilia, also the one that, uh, that uh, uh, Pauline is, uh, is running to do better their job. I think there are a number of things FAO, organization like FAO can do, for example, uh, you know, a lot of these markets for, for products that will emerge from these uh, uh, innovations, you know, they are increasingly local, national, and regional markets. You know, I'm looking at timber uh, and, and other value chains. And, uh, you know, one of the constraints we've been told by, by companies and funds is that it is difficult to mobilize uh, investments in a situation where we know very little about these markets. You know, we don't know how fast these markets are growing, um, you know, how to uh, segment these markets, where these markets are gonna be. And I think uh, organizations like FAO uh, is in an excellent position to, to support uh, this. Uh, uh. Also, it is very much, uh, you know, part of our mandate really to, to work with uh, constituencies like uh, uh, to reduce rural poverty, therefore, you know, in terms of the beneficiaries, in terms of promoting policies that can uh, facilitate that. So um, uh, this is uh, something that uh, organizations like FAO can do. Uh, one of the things we've been, we've been asked to support is uh, uh, the setup of uh, forest finance information hubs. Uh, which is uh, uh, places at the local, national, or, or, or regional level that can provide uh, information, especially for this type of constituencies, the, the, the poorest, the more uh, marginalized. Uh, you know, big companies have easy access to information. They can do their own due diligence studies. They can do their consultancies. But, uh, um, uh, you know, the small farmers, producer organization have a lot more difficulty to access this information. That is also uh, right. what they would be nice to, to, to support with. Fantastic. So in the meantime, there's an active discussion uh, going on uh, in the comments section, which is uh, fantastic uh, to see. We've also received a couple of questions already, and um, I'd like to uh, 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 read one of the first questions uh, here, which is regarding uh, the finance, uh, regarding finance access uh, to finance a restoration project. How to access the finances allocated to support a restoration project? How? And at which level these finance can be accessed? A uh, group of organized smallholders, farmers can apply for the NGOs or government ministries. In other words, who from the restoration stakeholders is eligible to get these finances. I think that's a real fundamental question because if there's one thing that also came out of the interview series, you know, and some of these interviews uh, were um, held with uh, representatives from, from banks. You know, banks want a concrete uh, um, organization that they invest in, right? Um, they can't just 
you know, if you are FMO or if you're, um, you know, the European Investment Bank, you don't, you invest, you reach the smallholder through an Othelia fund, or you reach it through yes, a exactly. farmer co-op. So what are some of the local structures that you see, for example, and Pauline, I'm first addressing this to you, um, that so, so, sort of the local entities, if you like, that can absorb an investment or that can take on a loan. What are some um, of the are out there? Yeah, um, well, they, there is a lot of, like we said, there's a lot of risk perception. And uh, an organization that is able to take on that loan is an organization that is able to, to demonstrate first and foremost ability to understand the risks, but also has the mitigation measures in place to deal with those risks. And um, so, so, so yes, so from first and foremost, the, the organizations like cooperatives or cooperatives and organizations like Ecotrust that bring together organizations, there is that ability to aggregate is an asset. Exactly. That ability to aggregate is an asset that can be can 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 be sold to 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 a bank, for example, or to a finance institution. But but I think that most people don't understand that it's an asset. We look we look very much o, o, on the, the the expense, the the, the rigor, the, the the drudgery that is involved in 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 putting together that platform of aggregation. But once an institution is able to master the art of aggregating the kind of target audience that they have, then it becomes an asset that, that will enable accessing uh, these uh, uh, sources of financing. Yes, and Juan Carlos, uh, so in Peru, for example, in your Madre de Dios uh, project, um, uh, who, who did you invest in? Who, gave, who, who you know, which bank account, you know, did you put the money in? Yeah. Yes, yes, it was the an NGO, and 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 this is why, as investors, we need to 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 diversify the way we we invest, and this is something that a fund, a specialized fund, that is incorporated as a risk capital fund, is able to do. This is why we believe that in the value chain, there is place for asset managers because, as you said, the European Investment Bank mm -hmm. won't won't go and do the due diligence and invest in Peru. Right, and they do tickets from twenty million. So uh, this is why we we think we believe that we have a role role to play, and we invest in the NGO in a way that the NGO in Peru uh, have NGOs can have administration contracts for protected areas, mm. meaning that it's like a concession for conservation for twenty years, where they will do what the government needs that they need to do because the government don't don't gift or don't the management, they just say, these are my rules you need to accomplish and they're audited every six months. In exchange to finance that, the government give the carbon rights. So we, we provide a loan to the NGO and in the project of the NGO was the protection of the park, meaning control and surveillance, research and biological monitoring and sustainable livelihoods in buffer zone with cacao. So against the carbon credits, we did we give an NGO the loan and they they actually leverage that loan or will able to get the loan through the carbon credits that the government give, provided that they achieve protection and rural development. So we have been able to, to, to put it in the account of the project managed by the NGO that is audited by the government and by us. We disburse in a quarterly basis on results of the project. So the, NG, the NGOs, we believe that NGOs are massive aggregators, as, as our friend Polina was saying. They are key, key stakeholders for us. Uh, they, and the NGO, for example, and just to finish, Aider, as an NGO, said, we will be here for six, seven, ten years. But they mm -hmm. aggregate the farmers into a cooperative that today exists, is certified fair trade, it has its own management, and Aider has a JV with them for supporting them for six, seven, eight, ten years, and then the cooperative will be completely autonomous. So we believe that the NGOs are great catalyzers. They 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 are they they have the habit to, to administrate external funding, which yeah. is, which is good, which is interesting. 
and 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 then uh, create. They have the social capital, technical capital that we can provide. You know the business acumen uh, in order to build. You know this this business around. So uh, the NGO in this case have been the catalyzer and aggregator of the financing. Today there is either plus Copa Certa cooperative, and tomorrow the NGO will be out. We'll go to another project, and we will have farmers organized around a cooperative that will receive financing from other financiers. Yeah. So you do need then very specific government policies to enable those private investments, right? Is that uh, that's that very specific? Yeah. But it is it's what is like the the chicken and an egg. Because what happened is that the German corporation was financing the protected areas in Peru. Then the government was just receiving the money. And then at one moment, the Germans say, okay, we don't have any more money. And then the government was crazy. Oh, what do I do? So they say, okay, NGOs, tell me what are your ideas for financing the protected area system? And then NGOs say administration contract against and that you can have environmental services. So mm -hmm. actually this innovation didn't came from a, you know, and don't, don't take me wrong, from a bureaucrat in the ministry saying, okay, how I will do better my job was actually a, a constraint and necessity that bring innovation. And we are firm believers of innovation under constraint and, and stress. So the government said, how I can, you know, take money to do it? And the environmental services was, was the key. So was not a government policy that came from government, NGOs pushing the government saying this is a good idea and then we just I won't say jump on the opportunity but the, the, the circle wasn't closed but we say guys if you do this we will put the money and at the end you know everyone agreed now there's something really interesting that you said there you said the Germans pulled the money and the money was basically sitting with with the government and you know, that, that sort of addresses perhaps a bit of a larger issue here as well, and that is, you know, how do you organize for innovation? How do you empower um, your, your frontline employees in a way? And uh, perhaps, uh, Marco, uh, can you share with experience? I believe that uh, <coughs> you were you know, working or going to visit a local association of forced communities of the Peten, Akofop. Um, Michael, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm here, yes. You, okay. So perhaps you can uh, share with us, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, empower um, organizations such as IDER, such as Ecotrust, um, and what is sort of the right attitude, perhaps, um, in, in, in all of this? Well, I think uh, we have heard of two organizations, Ecotrust and IDER, that are already doing uh, a phenomenal job. Um, you know, coming from a, a development organization, I mean, uh, we were we were chatting the other day. I find that it is very useful to have uh, an attitude of believing that it can be done. You know, because uh, oftentimes these more producers are described as you know uh, marginalized. They are uneducated. They're not ready to engage in value chains. So have all of these kind of a negative. Uh, connotations and uh, I was sharing with you that uh, it is helpful to have an attitude of, of seeking you know maybe the giant that is asleep you know when uh, uh, we traveled many years ago with a colleague of mine to Guatemala that is how we described the, the people we were going to, 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 to meet he says, you know, they are described in a very negative terms. So these are poor, marginalized. They have a history of oppression, etc., etc., etc. But they really are there. They own the land. They control a lot of the resources. I see a giant that is asleep. And if we can awake this giant, they will be able to do amazing things. And in fact, they did. They, they really anybody who knows the story. Of, uh, of the uh, associations uh, in Guatemala can really attest to what they have 
Mm -hmm. So I think one of the attitudes is really to have a, an attitude of, of, of really uh, going beyond maybe the immediate reality and really see what is the potential, you know, and how can we can bridge this gap between what we see and what could be. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'd like to follow up on another question here, and please keep them coming. We still have a few minutes here. Uh, there's a question for, the, for Juan Carlos, um, and that is, uh, how does Athelia set a minimum standard for social and environmental returns of your investment? And, and how far are investors willing to go in terms of, of uh, risks? Yes, yes. So we, we have developed uh, before, of course, entering to the market, but of course, it has been modified across, you know, the, the time that we have been active our uh, ESG policies and also what we what we have which are our ESG environmental social and governance standards so we have a set of standard that you know each of our projects needs to follow the projects are audited against those standards if we they, they fail during the due diligence period we don't do the investment in addition to this as you know some projects probably what because we are not here to reward people that do everything good we, we are here to create value you know so for standing from a bad or you know you know not excellent you know situation to a good situation so we what we have is if we have people that you are not complying with the standards but have good potential what we have is uh we do the investment and we have what we call a isap environmental and social action plan so we how we can get the projects to the standard that we actually want to, to 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 go in addition to this uh the, the project proponent uh they need to present to us uh, impact met metrics so we have seven impact themes climate livelihood sustainable enterprises biodiversity women empowerment and then we have a set of indicators for each of these themes so they need to present to us what is the return in terms of those impacts and if in the investment proposal is very poor Maybe it's because there's a potential, but they don't have not, you know, uh, qualified it well, and we can work it out, or maybe the project is really not interested, then we let it go. And then the projects needs to report, they, they report and to us, not just in terms of the budget and then financial returns, but also in terms of the impact matrix and in a quarterly basis. And then we have each year an impact report, <coughs> an impact report, where we actually share, you know, to, to, to the public and to our investors uh, how the projects are going in terms of, of impact. We know, and this is something, and, and I will just finish with this, our investors, uh, we, we believe that they have understood very well the risk and they are ready to take a loss. That's of course, nobody wants to lose the money because we want to keep the patrimony to be reinvested and we do the best we can. But they understand those risk. But they will never, never, ever, you know, uh, give up on the impact. If we have a very profitable project, which is very, you know, with no impact, I will be fired. Mm. And, and it's, it's that simple. But if we have a project that, you know, it's getting there we're creating a new revenue model and it's getting but the impacts are huge our investor will be patient because uh here we are in, you know in the creation of new models but you know in, in the impact is is the reason what we have you know uh being created it was just for earning money they will go to other activities uh mm -hmm. so is that the, the, the way we work yes that's that sounds very um that sounds very so so basically you're returning double Double digit returns to your investors, is that right? Double digit? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would love. I would love. I would love to oh, get okay. double digit return. But that would be that would be more more than you know the the you know the the stock exchanges in, in very major markets or mid markets yeah. in you know, the US or on on, 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 on or, or, or the UK or Europe. No, no, that's that's not true. Uh if we return and you know don't 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 quote me but i mean I be totally transparent if we can return to investors above five percent uh, irr it's they will be very happy 
because th this means that you know uh, he, he, with all the impacts, you know, it's huge. When we have a PV twenty percent IRR, there's something suspect there. So is there you know? Yeah, doing a little bit wrong, or they are not very, you know, expert that they don't look at the risk, or maybe they are just, you know, extracting money or you know the value by you know pushing farmers to to be poor. So that so Great. that we have what we have encountered. So we are past the one hour now, uh, but we do keep some questions coming in. Uh, I fully understand if people want to. Um, sign off now. Uh, however, um, I would like to ha take two more questions and uh, and see, and perhaps uh, we can have a, uh, just a brief brief answer to these questions. Um, you know, it, one of them is the role of guarantees that can be, let's say, issued by development bank. Um, so perhaps, uh, Marco, you know, can you, you, you were talking about perceived risks. Um, do you think that guarantees are a, a good instrument um, to overcome these perceived risks? Well, I will, I will keep this answer very short because I'm not an expert on guarantees, but definitely I think guarantees are, are a key way of, of de-risking you know, investments and especially in the phases where, where the risk is, is higher. I'm sure Juan Carlos can, can can speak much more knowledgeably than me about uh, about guarantees. Juan Carlos, <laughs> you know all about guarantees. Yes, you, you uh, no, some. thank you, Mark. No, 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 not all, uh, and I'm not an expert at all, but I I I really uh, experience the benefit of it. Uh, just b very briefly, our first fund. We closed it at 60 million. It took like three years to the funders to, to close the 60 million. Uh, and then uh, we received a 50% loss warranty from the US government for you know up to $133 million of investments. And seven months later, we, we reached the, the 100 million. So uh, it took 60 million, three years, and then you know six months to, to just close the fund and the second closing. That was necessarily because there, there was a guarantee. We are launching, it's public now, a biodiversity fund for the Amazon in Brazil. And we are receiving a, a, a strong support, uh, first loss warranty from the US government. And um, that is helping greatly to, 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 to go to the $100 million fund dedicated for Brazil uh, in Peru. Uh, I just Marco was saying something very interesting. Um, local money. So in countries like Mexico, uh, Colombia, Peru, Chile, uh, pension funds have too much money because they have limits on invest on invest on the investment they can do abroad. And they have billions of dollars on you know on, on, on money, and the stock exchange uh, in the case of Peru is very little. So uh, this with this surplus of cash that you know the institutional investor have locally they they won't risk it right they will do it responsibly but guarantees are a great great uh, great instrument and we are in conversations deep conversations with largest with the largest uh, pension funds in in Peru and Colombia for uh, with, with some government guarantees to, to put a dedicated in, uh, funds locally so local funds won't be any more Altira will be involved as an European asset manager, but will be local funds paying taxes, you know, in, in Peru, in Colombia, investing Colombian money, Peruvian money into Colombia and Peru, uh, thanks to guarantees. And, and this is something that um, the Dutch government, the French government, the US government uh, are, are, are doing. And I, I would it's... just before finishing, it's a good investment for governments because uh, we pay. <laughs> we pay them for the warranty and we don't want to lose the money. So uh, they receive the money because in the, in, it's like an insurance. Uh, and as you know, insurance companies, they, they, they earn a lot of money because, you know, and there's no always losses and people don't want to lose the money. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good mix between the incentives uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and a wise, wise, wise way to, to use capital. 
Well, that sounds really great. I, and I think we can devote a whole digital summit to uh, how to mobilize local finance for conservation ideas, because uh, I think that is something that is uh, quite um, uh, quite important. Uh, I have one last um, yes, one last question, and that um, there is a uh, it's it's a question about cherry picking. Um, so how how do you avoid that we uh, that you know following investors' um, demands or investors' preferences for impact, that we cherry-pick the very best and most profitable productive assets, uh, but not reaching scale. How, how do we avoid this conundrum? Well, I can say just a couple of words on this. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, in general, investing in certain landscapes and, 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 and financing these activities and making this financing inclusive is already a huge challenge. I would say if there are uh, situations that we can call cherry picking, I would say let's really uh, learn from them. Let's, uh, there is a lot to be said. We need to demonstrate still that it can be done. I mean, the, what we've learned today and also in the previous uh, interviews says a lot that, you know, a lot is being said, but I think a lot more need to be said and demonstrated and documented. So I wouldn't uh, frame it as how to avoid cherry picking. I mean, I think the question is more like, how do we turn the cherry picking opportunities into something that can be m with much broader pieces? Yeah. Juan Carlos, any last words on that? Mm, I, I think that the, the, the asset managers need to invest in, in teams, into front office teams and, and go there and look for new projects. Because it's true that you can have a very nice project with four funds, and then you, you actually have a problem of they will cherry pick who are the investor I take, and then, then when you have too much money into one counterparty, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. To have, you know, very good institutions that have done well, then you have woof, a lot of money, a lot of investors arriving to, to knock on their door. That could be very detrimental. Uh, so so, so I, I, I believe that uh, we need to do a, a, a work of getting out of the, our comfort zone, go to new frontiers, new, new projects, and keep 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 risking, uh, because uh, if we if we if we don't risk in in no industry something new that have arrived, uh, everything was set before that things were done. Uh, yeah. We I, I agree with Marco. A lot of is to is to be set, and for that you know you know uh, investor needs to be there and governments. It's incredible how governments are that slow, and how private investors are going, you know quicker it's incredible sometimes you know that we are in new york or we are in london or in paris and we have a, a week of very productive meetings and then we have money lined up six months after with private investors that fully private and then with a government development bank two years three years and that we i understand the political timing but we are also facing a climate urgencies and I, I think and it, it's a call because we are the government meaning the people to you know to to write to our MPs to you know to participate and to push to for, for, for more governments to do more because government has a largest instruments and no scale will be rich without government. Excellent. Private can be yeah. nice around, but no scale can be rich without public action. Well, thank you so much and um I think that's uh, that's that's uh, those are real wise words. Uh, I think we're going to leave it at that because we are now ten minutes past the hour, and uh, I want to thank uh, you, of course, um, for participating in this uh, this digital summit. Unfortunately, we have lost Pauline, but of course, a big thank you to Pauline as well. We will do yes. that separately, um, and uh, I want to thank the audience uh, it was uh, really nice to see all the 
the whole discussion uh, going through and all the connections that are being made and the questions that are being asked. And a very special thanks to uh, Selina Abraham of the Global Landscape Forum and Bas Laumann of Tropobos International for making this digital summit happen. Now we hope to see you back after the summer holidays uh, for the e-dialogue and the Global Landscape Forum in Luxembourg later on this year. Uh, thank you all very much for tuning in and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.